knowing that a guy has physically touched every single element of that kitchen, put every single screw in by hand, he takes pride in what he's doing and that shows in the end result. I would say 100% of the time, when we walk away, we know we've done a good job. We're probably one of the last of a dying breed of cabinet makers who do it the traditional way. Yeah, We're no still, CNC's. No CNC's. We're still using traditional mortise and tenon joints and dovetail joints. We still use a lot of solid timbers. Um, any lacquering work we do ourselves, it's all, all by hand, which is dying. It doesn't matter what way you look at it. You know, something comes off a CNC machine. You don't need a tradesman to assemble it. You can, we call them screw monkeys. You can put a screwdriver in a guy's hand and he can assemble what you put in front of him. And there's a big difference, isn't there, between those two ways of working? Because when I read that on your site, I was quite incredulous, to be honest, because you're shunning all the you know modern ways of getting scale, um, cutting things to to measure. What's the value in preserving some of these hand making techniques for cabinetry that you that you don't get from CNC and machining? I suppose there's the element of the components that a CNC machine will use things like cams and dowels, etc. And they've got their place, don't get me wrong. But knowing that a guy has physically touched every single element of that kitchen, put every single screw in by hand, he takes pride in what he's doing and that shows in the end result. And that's what our clients expect to see. What is the type of client that selects you for specifying their kitchen and not going the, the packaged route? Our clients are generally um, 40 plus, affluent, semi-retired, retired, retired um, who know what they want. They've been down the route of the, um, the kitchens that you can buy from some of our competitors that have been cut by CNC and assembled and et cetera, et cetera. They want to know that when they get their next kitchen, it's gonna last them 15, 20 years, which they do. Um, they, our clients like to know that they could come into our factory at any time and view their kitchen in progress. Now, if you've got a CNC machine that's cutting all the sheets out in one go, and several guys throwing it all together, they miss that opportunity. Because, you know, they might come in one day and there's nothing there, they might come in the next day and the whole thing's assembled and ready to go out. Because it is literally a 24 to 48 hour process to make a kitchen that comes off of a CNC machine. Whereas with us, it can be anywhere up to, well, our longest project took us eight months. What does that give you in terms of the ability to, to customize for one of your clients? We don't, I mean, with regard to joinery, you know, you get your styles and you get your fashions and whether it be um, shaker style or a flat panel or cake card or whatever it may be. We don't, we try not to replicate any one kitchen. So every single kitchen is individual to what that client has discussed at our very first meeting. That's awesome. I've been into some, some, pretty amazing kitchens, usually from those who are as chefs or in the hospitality industry. So they know from their their commercial kitchens what they want. And I remember uh, one chef, Kent Badley, and I said, why have you got no, there's, there's no handles, there's no doors on anything. And he said, well, why would you have handles and doors? And I said, well, to make your kitchen clean, like you can see everything. He goes, I've got pots and pans that are worth thousands of dollars. Why do I want to hide that away? And what would I get from having a normal kitchen? And then he asked me this question. He said, what goes in the bottom drawer above your knife and fork drawer? And I said, I don't know, um, plastic bags. And he goes, what are you doing putting plastic bags in a drawer in your kitchen? And it was at that moment that I realized that when you really think about a, a kitchen as art, which he was doing from his commercial restaurant days, it has a different perspective and one that, that probably I'm, I'm far earlier on the journey than, 
than yourself for? I think what you need to consider is, and we discuss this at every meeting we have with clients, where's the first room the ladies who are looking to buy the house go to? And it's always the kitchen, followed by the bathroom. That's their first place that they'd make a beeline for it. They might not know where it is in the house, but somehow they make a beeline for it and they find it. And when we design and install a kitchen, I want to give those clients the wow factor. I want the the new people who potentially buy in the house go, I don't need to change this. This is perfect. What are some of the, the considerations? Like how are Kiwis living? You know, over the years, kitchens seem to, you know, if you get a dated house from the 90s or the 60s, there's a very specific way that they're set up. They might have an island or they might have a separate pantry. Um, very few have sculleries, but you see more of those now. Um, what are what are the, some of the trends that you see as um, contemporary that are going to last? The biggest, the biggest, I'll, I'll say the biggest seller is without question a shaker style kitchen. It's two or three hundred years old. The style it's never gone out of fashion. It doesn't matter whether you've got a contemporary house or a traditional house. It fits. How you amend that is. Do you want hardware? Do you want handles? Do you want synchronized opening, um, push to open, lacquer colors, bench tops? You just add variants, but the core is still shaker style is definitely a continued trend. So that's called, was it a shaker style? Shaker style. And if it's been around for two or 300 years, it, it's it's weathered the, the time of, can we improve something? And people go back to that particular style. Is that right? Yeah, it was originally designed because back in the day you could only get really short lengths of timber and to make up a door or a drawer front, you had to join bits together. So it's continued. And, you know, we make ours the traditional way. Back it, back when it was originally conceived, it was mortise and tenon joints. We still do ours the same way. That's amazing. Now, you purchased this business, right? So what attracted you to it initially back in, I think it was 2015 when you purchased the business? It's actually five years ago, two days ago, um, that I took over. My background was predominantly commercially driven. I'm a carpenter and joiner by trade, but at 27, I came off the tools and went into management. And... It was, like I say, it was driven commercially. So I did a lot of retail, hospitality, offices, et cetera, et cetera. And prior to purchasing Creative Kitchens and Interiors, I was the business development manager for a much bigger company. And, one, and I managed several businesses and one of them was a joinery company. And we did a few small residential projects, but I was getting tired of the commercial sector. And I probably jumped in quite naively to buy creative kitchens and interiors thinking I can take the same ethos that I've used on the commercial and retail into the residential. And I couldn't have been more wrong. What was the ethos that uh, you thought you could take across that didn't turn out to be the case? Being cutthroat is, is the honest truth. In the commercial sector, you basically fight to win the jobs because you're in a tender market. Um, but I was, like I say, I was naive to think that coming into a residential market, I'd be still faced with six or seven other competitors for this one kitchen. And I was cutthroat. Little did I know that actually, you know, I'd done my due diligence, et cetera. Um, I'd left the company that had, I was managing probably 30 staff into a, buying a company that had eight staff, um, all with the same mentality that the original owner had bred since 1984 and here's me the new owner cutthroat i've got to go and win this i'm gonna get it and i'm just gonna take the same mentality into it wrong forget all that that didn't work <laughs> <laughs> i like your your honesty there and um that's the that's one of the challenges isn't it when you buy a business you want to make your mark on it but at the same time you bought it for a reason right you yes. you bought it because of what it, it is. And yes. so there's that balancing act between preserving what is great 
and evolving it the way you see it could be evolved? Between me first entering that business with the mentality I had then, I basically got the mentality now that was bred in 1984. So everything I knew about the retail, everything I'd been told, this is how you, this is how you work in the retail and commercial sector. I've got none of that now. It's all gone. That's fascinating. That, that even though your background is cabinet making and, and it's still you're still doing exactly the same thing, if you like, the same industry, just shifting from commercial to residential, it, it's an entirely new way of approaching the market. Well, you're no longer dealing with... When you do a retail and a commercial project, you're dealing with somebody who's been given the task to complete a project by, by the client. So let's say, hypothetically speaking, you're doing a, a restaurant for Burger King. You're never going to meet the top man at Burger King. He's got a delegated number of staff below him spending his money. Now, I'm dealing with Mr. and Mrs. Smith at 48 Papamoa Beach Road. It's their money. They want to know how every single cent is being spent. And, you know, the one thing I, I actually say to every one of our clients, I will open my book. I will show you how your kitchen's priced, where every dollar's gone. There's my margin. There's the hours it's going to take if you want me to show you. And 99% of the time, no thank you. But the opportunity is there for them to look at it. Now, you, you said there that you've got a, a team now of eight. And... I found a couple of quotes from your uh, cabinet makers on, on your site, which I just absolutely love. One's from uh, Matt, who says, yep. the best reward is seeing a customer satisfaction from something I built with my own hands. Mm -hmm. And the other was uh, Mil Milo, I think it is, is it Milo? Yep. Milo. Uh, that you have to have a good laugh at work or you'll cry. Correct. There must be some <laughs> super challenging projects that... Um, that take a detour when you're, you're halfway through. Like, what are some of the, the challenges that you have to overcome when you're working in cabinet making with your hands, with, with an environment sometimes that's being built around um, your kitchen and plans change? What are some of the, the struggles and, and roller coasters that, um, that Milo and Matt and yourself have to deal with? Clients changing their mind is a big one. Um, because everything we do, and I mean, everything we do is traditional, including the drawings. I still draw on paper and pencil. No way. Not use computer-aided CAD, nothing. Everything is paper and pencil. And, um, you know, I sit down for hours with clients and we, we talk through everything. And the biggest one is the client changes, without a question. We did a project... In the South Island, I can't divulge because there's a confidentiality agreement around it. But it took just over eight months to do. And it was fraught with changes. Now, we, as you know, we operate out of Tauranga. This project was in Queenstown. You don't just make a change and nip around the corner and fix it. There's a lot of calculated procedures to do when you're working remotely like that. And... All of the issues around that project were client changes, which is fine. You know, they were happy to pay for them, but there's still the logistic nightmare of it. You know, and you can finish an item. Let's say it's a piece of furniture. Let's say you built a really nice hutch dresser. The client can come in and change it. At the last minute, you've just spent five, six weeks making this beautiful walnut hutch dresser. They're happy to pay for the changes. We're happy to make them. Mr. and Mrs. Client, have you got what you wanted at the end of the day? Yes, we have. Thank you very much. Big smile. That makes Matt happy. We're, we're all good. What are some of the um, what's some of the feedback you get on handover? You know, when they sign off the the final document to say, "Yep, we're happy with the kitchen. It's all yours now." What's the the feedback? We we when we're secure to make a kitchen. There's a several step process, obviously up to the point of the client saying, yeah, I want you guys to make the kitchen, the relationships with me, they don't generally see the guys. As soon as they said that, they then come back into the 
office in the factory, I already know who's going to make that kitchen. And I introduce them. Right, Matt, this is Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Get to know them. You're making the kitchen. And the added bonus as well is whoever makes the kitchen in our factory is the guy that installs it. So that relationship starts at day one. It's got to. And then Matt will go off to site and he'll do the site measure. He'll do everything. He'll, I'll give him the drawings, the same drawings that the client's got. He will make amendments, you know, on measurements, etc., etc. Et and that relationship starts there. Matt is the best friend to Mr. and Mrs. Smith to the very end of the project. Then on the final day, when we're just about to say, there you go, we're finished, me and Matt will go to site. And then it's like, the best one we've had, oh, what we've all, sorry, just to digress, the client comes in when the kitchen's assembled in their factory as well, in our factory, and we do the little tweaks, you know, because all of, such as the cutlery inserts, they're all bespoke made out of solid timber. So, right, right, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, what secrets do you have your knives and forks in? Where do you want your spoons? Where do you want your ladles? We go through all of this. And then at the end of the project, the best one we've had was we had one lady, I won't give you her name, and she's still a client, absolutely burst into tears. And what do you do? You know you've hit the, you, you've hit the brief. I'm not saying that every client cries her eyes out, but I would say 100% of the time when we walk away, we know we've done a good job. That's fantastic. I think you're, a, it sounds like, you're approaching this uh, as not just craft, but as, as art. It's not an installation. It's it's something where you're working to the brief uh, from the client, but you're also putting in all these details that maybe even the client doesn't see. Some of that, that handiwork, only you or the team will know that that's sitting in behind it. Exactly. There's a lot that goes into our kitchens. You know, don't forget we do vanity units, wardrobes, traditional furniture, dining suites, dining chairs. Um, there's a lot the client doesn't see. Because when we finish a kitchen and all the doors are closed and the handles are on and it's all nice and clean, they don't know how it was made. They know it was traditionally made, but they don't know there's little tweaks here or, oh, if we do this in, in house, it'll make that better. And, you know, probably 75% of the time, we won't tell them about the tweaks because on the face of it, the drawings they've got, Oh, my kitchen looks just like these drawings but it doesn't operate like it what's it like uh, sean to you know to become a cabinet maker you know i'm thinking a few years ago now when you first got into it um for those kiwis that are thinking you know maybe this could be a, a career for me um what are the the skills or the attitude that you have to have to to enter this uh, industry and be successful I think that you need to be, um, you need to understand that to do an apprenticeship, you've got to have a passion. Doesn't matter whether it's cabinet making, brick laying, plastering, you need a passion. And if you don't have that, you're never going to succeed. Because, you know, to be a cabinet maker, anybody can go and get an apprenticeship. I've just taken one guy on. We were advertising for um, experienced cabinet makers. The key word, experienced. This kid comes and sits in front of me. I won't give his name. I want a job. Well, what do you want to do? I want to be a cabinet maker. How long have you wanted to be a cabinet maker? And he looked at his watch and it went about five minutes. I've wanted to be a cabinet maker for the last five minutes. He says, but I am going to work for you. And by the end of the interview, I offered him a job. Wow. Um, he actually starts next month. But, you know, don't think, what what often gets forgotten is, Becoming a tradesman, whether it's a cabinet maker or whatever, and especially, and I'll be biased, cabinet makers and joiners, it's not cheap. You get you get your apprenticeship and there's a dollar value fixed to that, which is your training and the tech fees and all that sort of stuff. But the tools, you need serious commitment because you're going to be spending thousands on tools. Not just Not just a hammer and a screwdriver, I mean, I've still got my toolkit from when I was 16 and I still add to it. I've not been on the tool since I was 27, but I still add to my toolkit. It's an obsession. It's a passion. And unless you're passionate about it, 
you're not going to do it. Does but the... the unfortunate side is the apprenticeship schemes now. I don't, I don't know what the government's going to do. They're just they're no good. They don't work. There's too much fast tracking. I did four years of block release, day school, night school. Now it's it's done in hours. How quick can I get you through this apprenticeship? So you can become a qualified tradesman and command a, a certain salary. But what a lot of people forget is you come out your apprenticeship at whether it be 1920. Some kids go into this with the idea that I'm going to be 20 and I'm going to be earning this much money, forgetting that you need experience. There's nothing like putting hours on the clock and, uh, there's almost four stages, isn't there? The, the first is that you're unconsciously incompetent. There's been no training. Then you go through training and you become consciously incompetent. You now know what you don't know. Yeah. Then you become consciously competent. You're like, all right, I know it and I can do it. And then there's this fourth stage, which is becoming, um, you're unconsciously competent. You're not even thinking about it, which actually has some downsides as well, because you, you might do things by rote and, and you don't get the new tools. You don't learn the new new ways of, of yeah. doing things. I, th I think with us, you know, I'm a big advocate on apprenticeships. I think there's obviously a position for them and there's a need for them. You know, as a country, we're grossly lacking in skilled tradesmen. Um, so apprenticeships are great. But whenever an apprentice, apprentice starts with us, we take him downstairs and we introduce him to his best friend who's going to be his best friend until the next apprentice comes along and that's a sweeping brush and yet believe it or not you have to teach people how to sweep up we had one guy come in you know he wants an apprenticeship and if you imagine the rubbish bins are over there isn't the natural progression to sweep that way towards the rubbish bins not in this kid said and it didn't matter how many times we told him, sweep towards the bins. No, I'm going the opposite way. Unfortunately, it didn't work for him. You know, he he was one of these by self-attrition, exited the business. But their best friend for the first year is the sweeping brush. There's a joy too, I think, only when looking back, when you've done those, those hard jobs first, my uh my dad got me first working in counting inventory in a power tool um, second hand appliances fixing appliances and he said your job is to do stock take and i would be on my own in the inventory room for days and days earning 50 cents an hour picking up and counting these pieces but what I didn't know, which he obviously knew, is that once I'd done that for two or three years of stock take, I started to recognize what each of these were. I could remember, oh, that's a Cambrook part, or that's Bosch, or that's AEG. So he was teaching me all of the makes and models without yeah. me knowing it. And it's yeah. those little things that seem like it doesn't, it's meaningless and, you know, it's not going to get me anywhere. And, you know, I'm 20 and I want to go places quick. But it's that sweeping that if you apply that to everything else, actually that, yep. that you can build on. Yeah, I, th I mean, it never seems to astound me subconsciously when you're doing these mundane jobs, how much you actually absorb about everything else, what's going on around you. You know, the guys sweep the factory. You look at things while you are sweeping up and it's those subconscious things that you remember or the things you see, you know, something might be out the corner of your eye while you're sweeping up oh that's right that's where it is time saved lean management fantastic i saw let's talk a little bit about the lean manufacturing side of it because that is something that you you instill in your team when producing yeah. a kitchen what does lean manufacturing mean to creative kitchens and interiors i mean you've got to reduce the waste out of a business um and the easy way to say oh so cut this board slightly differently, don't waste so much tape, don't do this, don't do that, don't throw sanding discs on the floor. To me, the lean management is, is the biggest waste is time. How long have I spent looking for this 
throughout a bit. How long have I spent doing this? When If everything's in its place and everybody knows where it is, it's, it's straight to the shelves and I've got it. There's no wasted time. It's expensive time. Time is incredibly expensive. See, again, the, the number one thing with what you just answered on lean manufacturing, it's not faster methods of cabinet making. It's, again, the fundamentals, putting things back, having a system, knowing what that system is so your body and your team can work in harmony with each other. I mean, the reality is if somebody was to walk into our factory, they would probably turn around and say, this looks like Beirut. How do you find anything? But every one of my employees knows where every single item is, and that's all I'm bothered about. Excellent. In terms of um, if someone wants to to start um, this process with you, if they want to you know, make a wardrobe or a dining table or do something maybe they've never done in their lives, but they've always wanted to commission something yeah. for their home. Um, what's the... Like I asked this to a jeweler and he said the first stage is, you know, get in contact and I'll do a watercolor of the jewelry. And if they l really love it, then we'll go ahead. Uh, if they kind of like it, we'll start again. Uh, yeah. What's your engagement process early on when someone's got an idea but ha is kind of fearful to share it because they don't want to commit to something until they know it's for them? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, obviously, you know, People either ring us randomly, they've found us on the internet through our website, an awful lot of referrals. Um, but generally what would happen is a client would call me and I usually insist on meeting them at the home. It's easy to come into the factory and sit in the office or sit in the showroom, but I like to see how people live. So if somebody's saying to me, I want a brand new kitchen in my house, but I don't know what I want. I probably hear that every every third or fourth kitchen. I don't know, I know what I don't want, but I don't know what I do want. So you, you go into their home, you look at their furniture and they will map out on subconsciously again, what they actually want just by talking to you. And it's all about making them feel comfortable. Don't be afraid to, I mean, from my perspective, I'm never afraid to make myself look stupid. I know I'm not stupid, but in the eyes of the client, I'm being a bit of a dick. And I try to relax them because as soon as somebody is relaxed, they open up. It becomes a friendly, friendly, natured conversation. There's banter. And as soon as you can get them talking freely, you make your notes. And at the end of the meeting, you do a recap. That's exactly what I want. But they've already told you that just subconsciously. You're based in Tauranga. Do you then need to travel uh, out? Will you do that, or is it a, is it over, you know, Zoom or, or FaceTime? I'm not where the client is. We travel nationwide. You know, like I say, the biggest project was down in Queenstown. Probably three or four times a month. I'm in Auckland, or it could be in Hamilton, or it could. I've got one to do down in Canes Bay, in Christchurch, uh, down Banks Peninsula, um, Wellington. I'm not bothered where they are. I'll get in the car or I'll get on a plane and go and see them. Excellent. Is there anything else that we need to cover off? The, the one question I've got here is um, how do you balance the aesthetics of what your end product should look like with actually the practicality of how it's going to work? The, the best thing that we've got is everything's in-house. So I don't have to rely on anybody to make my cabinets, to install my cabinets. I don't have to rely on anybody else to lacquer them, um, to choose the timbers, to choose the veneers. Because we take so much pride in what we do, we, we take ownership. That ownership doesn't end when the, kitchen, when the kitchen's installed and the client's absolutely happy. You know, most kitchen cabinet companies will give you a three to five year warranty Something goes wrong with your kitchen in 10 years. Yeah, we'll be straight round and there's no charge. We go back. Somebody had a drawer that collapsed and the kitchen was put in 13 years ago. And this was only a couple of years ago. So it wasn't my problem, but it was my company's problem. So we fixed it. Oh, how much do you get? Nothing. Nothing at all. I love that. I can guarantee you next time they want a kitchen, I know where they're going. That's the, I, I'm sure of it, that that's the best way to build your brand is 
when you don't have to do something, you do it anyway. Uh, a, a company that uh, I didn't realize it just joined New Zealand Made last year that does seating. The suspension on my, my chair uh, wasn't working as well. It was kind of sticking and I looked underneath and bureau seating gave them a call and it's out of warranty. You know, it's a seven year warranty, but this is nine years ago. And they not only replaced it, they sent around someone to switch it out. And this is just yeah. a, an office chair. Uh, and I, I wrote to the owners and said, this is magnificent what you're doing. You you don't realize how important this was. And I think this is, this is for the companies that don't manufacture here, it's not easy for them to do that. So for those that do that really like yourself, pay attention to that after sale service, uh, it can make a big impact. Yeah, you know, from us as a company, we're now servicing third generation. We did grandma and granddad's kitchen. They recommended us to their sons and daughters, and now we're into their sons and daughters. And for me, if something goes wrong with the kitchen outside of the warranty period, the cost for me to put a guy in a van, go and fix it, come back, get the phone call from the client who's absolutely wrapped, has more value to my business moving forward than me putting any print advertising together that cost me thousands that one act that client will come back that client will tell their friends and their family and i will get more work out of it by one simple act and yes it's going to cost you a couple of hundred bucks so what i've got a happy client and just to be a bit more explicit for the audience there what you're really referring to there is it's better to keep existing customers happy than it is to advertise for new ones. Yes. There's nothing better. There's no better way of advertising than word of mouth. If I'd, if I'd gone to one, this client whose drawer collapsed, fixed the drawer and sent her a bill, <coughs> excuse me, for three, four hundred dollars, I would never hear from them again. You just join the mix of you're coming back into the tender market for the next kitchen. Whereas now I know for a fact they'll come back. 100% and it won't be tendered, it'll be negotiated. And that I think speaks to what you said right at the start of the interview, which is how much you had to change going from commercial to this environment is that you're building lifelong relationships here and cutthroat and relationship building just don't go hand in hand. No, they don't. Um, you know, if I'd been in my retail commercial head, I'd have charged them the $500 and taken it gladly. But no, it doesn't work. Your biggest asset, there's two biggest assets in my business, my clients and my staff. They both walk hand in hand. That's a, a great lesson for any manufacturers to, to take on board. And, you know, many of them do talk about that. It's, it's not necessarily the tools, the process. It's not the manufacturing shed or production line. It's the people and it's the customers and serving the customers and solving their problems the way they want it to be solved with the best of talent that you can possibly put together for the project. Yep, definitely. I think what the key element here is Al, Al started the business in 1984. He's still with the business. Even though the ownership's changed, he's still with the business. And I think that what that portrays to clients is that the ethos and the beliefs of the company haven't changed. The fact that I'm the new owner is irrelevant. The, the approach we take and the respect we have for our clients hasn't changed. If I'd have gone in, well, I did come in five years ago with the commercial retail hat on, it wouldn't be here today. I had to change, not the business. And that's a very humbling thing to do later on in your career. So you've, you've obviously managed to make that that decision successfully to to preserve the the business you were acquiring you know many people coming into a business uh don't see that seed of of what makes it unique and you've seen it and grown it i came into this business with a a passion for keeping tradition alive and that's what well, that was the initial thing that made me purchase the business I went in there for a couple of weeks before signing on the paperwork to watch how they made stuff. 
and they're still using dovetail joints. They're still using more than tenon joints. It was how I was taught. You know, I'm 52 now. I've been doing this for a few years. Um, but to see it still being done today, there's not many that do do it and there aren't many that can do it. And that is the key. You know, in 84, we were originally manufacturing dining suites for the retail sector to go into, you know, retail shops. And we were doing eight, 10 dining suites a week out to 40 retail stores across the North Island until the Chinese market kicked in. And that killed it. And back then, Al had to make the decision, do I fold the business or do I diverse? And fortunately, he diversed into kitchens, carried the same mentality, the same traditional approach. And that's what's kept us going for, what is it now? 38 years. Many businesses are faced with that challenge is when you have a new entrant that can do the same solution, cheaper, uh, not to the same standards necessarily, or to the same standards, but it's not done handmade, it's all automated, there's less story with it, is you, you get to choose. You can decide to also go down that route and you, you better come first, and the first means lowest cost per unit, or you can go into a different area, which is we do things like this and people like it done this way, not because it's the most efficient or the cheapest. There's different attributes. And I think that the hardest thing is for businesses that are sitting in the middle that do a bit of both sort of still. Um, you're one of the, the, the first I've talked to that have really um, like gone to the, the edge, like hand making these things. That's really on the, the edge of, it's sculpturing, it's, it's art, as probably more than it is manufacturing. It's dangerous because you get left behind if you're not careful. Um, but we're in a throwaway society. It doesn't matter what you buy, it's got a lifespan, unless it's made traditionally. You can go into a very high-end house in England and you will find Chippendale chairs and Chippendale furniture that was made centuries ago. You cannot go into a house, a piece of furniture that IKEA made 15 years ago because it's fallen to bits. If you want something that's gonna be a legacy and a piece of, like you say, a piece of art, a piece of sculpture, you've got to make it traditional. And that has life. That is a, a great place to finish up. The, the one quick question I've got is, what's the last tool that you've purchased in your cabinet tree that, that you didn't need to, but you did anyway? I bought a 75 year old dovetail saw. No, I didn't, sorry, no, I didn't. I bought a set of chisels. Um, they were, whenever I look to buy tools, I go on the antique section of Trade Me because the tools of today are crap. This apprentice we've just taken on, I told him, go on Trade Me, go in the antique section, buy all your tools from there. And I showed him a set of chisels that you cannot buy today. And it was a full set of chisels and I bought those for $82. Wow. And I know for a fact, the newer version of them are $800. These chisels arrived, they'd never been used and they were made in the 60s. And I actually ended up giving them to one of my members of staff because he coveted them that much. What a gift and what an insight too that the, the, the tools can last, you know, in picking those up. Imagine how much use they're gonna get now um, in the right hands with the right direction with yourself. You don't go on to, and I'll use Trade Me as a, because everybody knows it. You don't go into the antique section of Trade Me and find things that don't last. Like I say, you won't find Meltica kitchens in the antique section. You'll find solid timber furniture and you'll find solid timber, whatever it may be, because it's got life, it's got longevity and it's got value. Fantastic. Um, I've really enjoyed our, our chat today, Sean. I've learned a lot as I usually do, um, but particularly I like this because of the, the century old techniques, that hand making that you're, preserving and not everyone can access it but that's just fine you're actually servicing just the right amount of people who want to go in this direction and i think uh, that's a, a real credit to you for what you're doing for new zealand i find it strange that you say not everybody can access it yes you can 
it doesn't have the value you think it has in the dollar value. All right. It's cheaper, it's cheaper than you actually think. So if I was to get a <laughs> something made for the for my lounge, uh, let's say a, a bookcase, and I wanted a, a nice. We talked before this interview started about um, you know books. Um, yeah. What would like if I wanted a, a cabinet made uh, bookshelf? What am I talking about there? Well, you know, how long's a piece of string? How tall is it? How wide is it? How deep is it? What do you want it made out of? Buying timber is like buying cars. You can buy cheap timber and it'll, it'll work. It does its job. Won't look good. Or you can buy expensive timber and you've got a bookcase for life. The process in making it doesn't change. How we make that bookcase doesn't change. What we use to make it is the, is, is the changing is factor. The well, I know where to come as soon as I decide that that's, that's the thing I need to do. Um, Just give me a ring. Really appreciate our, our chat, Sean. This is um, this has been a, an eye opener, and I'm looking forward to sharing this with the Kiwi Original community and also some of the um, the New Zealand manufacturers out there. I think this will be a really uh, interesting one for them to listen to. Thank you, Thank you very much.